Would you stand in a pit of 100 tiger snakes just because your boss told you to? Well, I don't know about you, but that is a hell no from me. Hey there, and welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. If you're looking to get more sales, more customers, master your marketing, and ultimately take control of your retail or e-commerce business, then you're in the right place. I'm Selena Knight, a retail growth strategist and multi-award winning store owner whose superpower is uncovering exactly what your business requires to move to the next level. I'll provide you with the strategies, the tools, and the insight you need to scale your store. All you need to do is take action. Ready to get started? Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. I'm Selena Knight, your host for today, retail growth strategist, and currently the owner of what I like to call post-trade show flu. Yes, if you have ever done a trade show, you will know all about post-trade show flu. It is that sickness of some kind that you inevitably get after a big event. And sometimes this happens after live events as well. I'm assuming it's got something to do with the fact that you're around a whole bunch of strange people with lots of bugs in the air, you're not eating as healthily as you'd like, you run off your feet, you're tired, you're not exercising, so your immune system goes down. Whatever the situation, I was hoping that this year I would not get it. But sure enough, here it is. So you have my sexy Phoebe from Friends, sultry, I've got a cold voice today. So I'm recording this episode just a few days after we come back, we've come back from Read Trade Shows and Elizabeth and I and our team had such a great time there, but oh my gosh, was it very, very tiring. It was very long days and quite emotionally draining as well because we were giving strategic advice to businesses of all size and we were doing it completely free of charge. So the great thing about doing this was we got to speak to so many of you and see firsthand the problems that you're having right now, the obstacles you're facing, the challenges that you've got, particularly around things like staffing and pricing and supply chain issues. But there are quite a few common themes that kept coming up in just about every conversation. So it was Elizabeth and I who were doing these strategy sessions. And when we'd have a five second break, we would talk about the different businesses, the different conversations, and we'd sit down and compare notes about the topics of conversation that were just recurring. And one of those was that too many of the people who sat down with us were the owner of the business and they were tired. Not tired because they'd been walking around the fair but tired because they'd been in business for quite a long time. Now, sometimes that was three years, sometimes that was 30 years, but pretty much every person who sat down was tired. They were overwhelmed. They were exhausted, but they still loved their business, which of course brought me to the conversation of creating a job for yourself versus being the CEO of a business. Because a job is a job. A job is a thing you turn up and you hopefully get paid to do. And it can be tiring. It can be draining. And it doesn't always give you that creativity or the freedom that you went into business for. Whereas being the CEO of business means that you get to choose the things that you enjoy doing. If you love doing the marketing, you get to focus on the marketing. If you love doing the books, you get to do that. If you love doing research and development, you get to focus on those things without being dragged down by the things that constantly drain you. So this recurring theme was that most of the people who sat down with us, their businesses were revolving around them. They were that pivotal piece. They were the energy. They were the driving force of the business. So if their energy dropped, the whole business dropped. And we were having conversations that just reinforced this. Conversations like customers coming into store and if the owner is not there, they'll choose to come back a different day. If the owner isn't there, 
that only 90% of the business continues to hum along as it should. And that 10% that doesn't get done is the stuff that is make or break. Sometimes uh, one of the stories I heard was the printer broke. But instead of somebody being empowered or having the common sense to, uh, depends on which side of the story you're looking, which side of the store you're looking on, was it the owner not giving that person the capabilities to do it? Or was it the staff member not feeling like they could do it or should do it? Whatever the reason, simple things like the printer breaking means that orders can't be shipped because there's nothing to print the shipping labels on. Or the receipt printer not working means that you can't give customers the receipt. Little things like that, which require the owner to be there to ensure that things go smoothly. I don't want you to be the owner anymore. I want you to be the CEO. I want you to have people who love working in your business. And that's what I'm going to try and help you to do with this conversation today that I'm having with Kath Clark. She is a little bit personal development coach, a little bit influencer, a little bit brand strategist, kind of a business and career coach. She's a multi-passionate entrepreneur and she helps people to build brands. Now, whether you've thought this through or not, you have built a brand. You have a brand. That brand is mostly you. And now we have to look at how you can leverage that and how you scale that without losing all of the things that you put into this business that need to stay in order to remain connected with your customers. Because you cannot do this alone. And scaling can be difficult if you don't know why it is that your business is in business. This is one of the reasons that we talk about this inside of Scale Your Store. Because if you don't know why people love you. You don't know why your customers love to shop with you. You don't know those intrinsic beliefs and values that you've instilled into your business. Then how do you scale? How do you tell somebody else? How do you bring people on so that they match up with what you need? Their personal beliefs, their personal values line up with how you want your customers to feel, how you connect with them, how you keep them coming back again and again. Now, super fun fact, when people apply to be on the podcast, we ask them to tell a couple, tell us a couple of things about them that they wish people would ask. And I love these questions because they are the best conversation starters. And Kath's was, why did you stand in a pit full of 100 tiger snakes? And that is how we start off today's conversation. Before we jump in, two things. First one, Uh, There is a little bit of salty language inside of today's episode. So if you're listening with kitties around, you might want to pop those headphones in. And if you're leaving this episode feeling very inspired to take some action in your business and be the CEO, then make sure you check out my Inventory Management Masterclass, where I'll show you how to get rid of the old stock that is piling up in your storeroom, on your shelves, in your stock room, in your 3PL, wherever the heck it is, why it's not even moving in the first place, and the formula to work out when it has to go. You can find that over at selenanight.com forward slash stock. All right, let's jump into today's episode with Kath Clark and find out why the heck she stood in a pit of 100 tiger snakes. Hey there, Kath Clark. Welcome to the show. Hey there, Selena. Thank you so much for having me. I have to start out by asking you, why the freaking heck did you stand in a pit of 100 tiger snakes in Tasmania? <laughs> because that was an, a previous life of mine where I, uh, I was working in television I'd managed to find myself a role as a production coordinator. I really wanted to be a researcher, though, so I'd sort of gone off down a little pathway accidentally. And we had, we were, it was a snake documentary. And so we had to get used to being around snakes because we were about to go to an island off Tasmania that was full of them. Everywhere (sighs) you trod, there was another (laughs) hole that you could fall into. No! (laughs) Big black tiger snakes. So we had to get used to being able to stand still like a tree and not freak out. So are tiger snakes poisonous? Oh, yeah. They're all poisonous. I mean, the only ones that aren't poisonous, and they're venomous, to be exactly right. Um, Can they kill you is the question. 100%. All snakes can kill you. Pythons will wrap around you, but but venom, yes. 
I don't understand why someone would actively choose to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a choice. It was part of the job. I was choosing to be in television and work on documentary. But, you know, they were like, we can't have you freaking out. Like if you see a snake, you can't freak out. And so it was a test. Did so, you pass the test? I did, which is weird because. Did you walk on the island? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, we lived on the island for like four days while we filmed. Uh. And you know, the funniest thing was that I wasn't actually scared. The, the only freak out I actually had was one night when I got a really like a bit of asthma and I couldn't breathe properly. And I was like, oh my God, like I don't have a puffer. What do I do? <laughs> so it wasn't even the snakes that was a problem in the, in, in the end anymore. It was the, the grass. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody get bitten? The host of the show, oh. believe, in, in it was a 12 episode sequence. And the first time we got bitten up in the Pilbara, um, we were like, you know, oh, no, that was Mount Isa, that's right. I said, we were like, oh, sucks to be him. This is awful. How are we going to, hopefully he doesn't die. How are we going to tell his family, you know, and Royal Flying Doctors, this and that. Um, but secretly the producers were all saying to each other, this is going to make a really great, great TV. <laughs> Did you wear like gumboots or something? I know we're not talking about the, the important stuff, but I, I need to know. Did, was there some protection? Well, you know, walking boots and gaiters, but nothing more than that, really. It's just about keeping your eyes peeled. Um, the funniest, well, not funny, the, the weirdest thing was that the snake that really almost killed the host because we were like, oh, great, yeah, he, he got bitten. So we've, we've got that episode in the bag. But then he got bitten two more times in two separate shoots. So, no. so three, three episodes out of the 12 ended up being this genius snake guy <laughs> being bitten. So this uh, this genius snake handler could not handle snakes as it turned out. But the, the one that nearly killed him was a tiny little curl snake that actually looked more like a little lizard. Which My goodness. Because we were planting death adders in, in, in Hessian bags in the middle of the night because, you know, we discovered the death adder. In you really didn't need to embellish this anymore. Like the host was doing a really good job. People would have been, I'm sure when they were watching it, they're like, they're just making this stuff up now. <laughs> <laughs> we were, we were, but until it was real, until the curl snake was a real thing and it actually happened and he actually nearly did die. Oh my gosh. Really bad because I was like, dudes, put the death adders away. There's a real actual yeah. snake over here on the ground. We should film this one. <laughs> This one's natively here. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, yeah. so behind a peek behind the scenes of TV production is so much of it is staged. Oh, so much! You've got yeah. I mean, you, you probably do have a pretty good idea these days because of social media. But back then, like you know, I worked in the in the background of my kitchen rules too, my restaurant rules. It was back then, and yeah, I mean, it was all staged. Everything was staged. The blue steak. Oh my god! Someone's got a blue steak. You know, we planted the blue steak. Do the people know? I know we, we will get to the story, but I feel like if I have questions, the people listening have questions. Yes. So, do the people like? Do the contestants know that that's going to happen, or are they just as shocked as well? No, yeah, though no, they're shocked as well. No, they they it, it's we, we gently ease them into the reality of reality TV. You know, <laughs> so the fakeness of reality yeah. TV. <laughs> yeah, we make them feel like. Um, they're going to be heroes and then slowly we start to craft their personality into what makes good television. <laughs> this is actually a really great segue to a conversation. <laughs> but when they cast the the contestants on these kinds of shows, are they deliberately going, who's the bitch? Who's yep. the sweet person? Yep. Who's going to ruffle the feathers? Hundred percent. Yes, they are. They are. I mean, they'll start with you know they've got to start somewhere. So they they pick you know they'll do some casting and they'll pick a couple of good talent. But then you know they are definitely like okay they they fulfilled a psychological role that they're going to play in this in this program. Now we're casting more specifically because we like those guys. So now we're going to cast more specifically for that type or that type. Definitely, it's all about variety. Okay. This is my question that will lead into the actual episode, <laughs> which is psychologically, why do you think, because you've clearly had a lot of firsthand experience with people who've been in the TV industry. And let's be honest, we can kind of move that out to things like social media and whatnot, like being in the public eye in whichever way, shape or form that is. Psychologically, why do you think these people decide that reality TV 
is is even an option. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't think. Yeah, I I mean, when we're talking about really bad TV, mm. and I and I did a podcast recently with someone who was talking about how as humans we actually like that really bad TV because and, and, and the reason it's scripted the way that it is is because we don't want it to be any way in any way, shape or form part of our lives. Like we want to just escapism. check out and escape escapism. Mm. So why do you think the people who audition for those shows and go on those shows think that it is a good good idea? Such a great question. Um, let me give you a bit of first-hand experience of that. <laughs> so it's because they want to build a personal brand. That's why, because they want followers, they want an audience, because they've got other things in mind. And this is the irony of life. So often as humans, we choose a pathway because we think it's going to get us where we want to go, but we don't realise that it's just a massive diversion. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you uh, a story about a family member of mine who I probably shouldn't name um, because she is actually relatively famous, um, and she begged me to come on a reality TV show with her when I was running my little baking business And because there was this day where we stood back and we looked through the window of my new little um, shop front in Port Melbourne with Frank Food and Me, which was a brand that I'd designed, which was part of the reason I ended up getting into sort of brand strategy was because I'd created this business and this following around this cute little bakery, and she was there the day the name went up on the window, and I burst into tears and she said, I hope someday that I have something that means as much to me as this means to you. Like I hope that, you know, I find my sort of purpose. And she'd studied acting um, at the Actors Centre and she's brilliant at it, amazing theatre actor. But what looked like, and this is just my perception, this might not have been what was going through her head, but my my sort of external view of it was that what she, the, the choices that she made, because she begged me, come on, my kitchen rules with me. And I said, no way. I've worked in the background of my restaurant rules. There is no way I am going on that TV show because I know what they'll do. They'll make you the bitch and me the doormat. And that's <laughs> going to be our pair up, you know, because that's our dynamic anyway, right? Yeah, like yeah. I'm so loving and giving and I'm always like, all right, yes, okay, yeah, <laughs> however I can help. So I knew what they were going to do to us and it was going to cause problems. Um, she ended up going on it with somebody else instead. Um, and to her credit, they did cast her as the bitch, and I knew they would. Um, and but she came back from it like she did a really good one eighty, and actually created a whole lot of following from that. Anyway, point is now she's an influencer, but in her heart, she's still an actress. You know what I mean? So mm. here she is doing something because she thought that it would give her the 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 sort of. I don't know. The street like cred? The street cred, exactly. The presence that would make her be chosen for these other things that she'd probably rather be doing. I don't know. We've never actually had that conversation, to be honest, but I, I know who she is at her heart. And this is what happens when I meet people. I can see what lights them up in their heart, what their most expansive self is and how they can bring that light to 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 sort of to fruition and and create something from it and for some people like the people you work with it's it's a it's a retail brand and all of that energy is like imbued into what ends up being a product and a sort of objective thing outside of themselves um that that but but it's but it's packaged in there, you know. It starts somewhere because people don't follow brands; they follow humans. They follow belief systems. They follow ideas that come from a person. That's how it all starts. So I've sort of I've tangented it off. But what makes people do it in the first place is because they want that following. They want to have the the impact, the purpose. That's where they start. But they just sometimes are a tiny bit misguided in how to get there. <laughs> so is that? Can we kind of, let's just simplify that down to they want to be famous? I reckon for sure there's some people that just want to be famous, yeah. Okay. Like just a little bit of attention deficit, you know, as a kid or something. <laughs> but realistically, for the people listening here, whether they've said it out loud, whether they will admit to it, let's be honest, they have a business that they want to be famous. As yes. a, whether that is just in your town, whether that is online, whether that is globally, mm. people don't start a business for just something to do. They start it because they either want to make an impact or they see mm. 
a gap in the market or they want to help people yep. or they want to make money, which is totally okay as well. Like that should be part of the thing as well. Mm. But with all of that in mind, surely people are thinking, I, you know, I, I need to be, I need this business to be famous. Yep. So, because it, without the fame, and I'm just, I'm air quoting for people who are listening and not watching, <laughs> without the fame, you don't have the customers. You have to, you have to find a way, whether you're advertising on social media, whether you're doing paid ads, whether you're out there with, you know, a whirly bird on the street. The fact is you have to be advertising, you have to be marketing, which means you have to have some level of fame to get the people in. Mm. Now, do you think, or what's your experience with that concept, because I have kind of simplified it, and this is not a conversation you and I had before we came on the show, so no. this is very left of field. Oh, I love it. I love left of field. It's great. Um, For a hang. <laughs> what, is, like, what is that level of fame in the back of people's minds and how does it affect what they actually do within their personal brand? Because at the end of the day, we – there are some manufactured brands, let's be honest. Mm. I just did a, a, a speech about this and people don't realize that there are, there are companies who partner products with celebrities because yeah. of their audience. Yes. And these, these businesses are machines. They are specifically da- designed for fast moving consumer goods. They actually don't expect any of these brands in air quotes again to last more than two years. Mm. So the, someone like Kim Kardashian, Yep. She is so outside of the fact that it actually stuck. There are very few brands where it sticks. Yep. And because we are so passionate about why we opened our businesses, I think we grapple with that concept that someone would deliberately manufacture a product just to sell for two two years or 12 months or six months or two months yeah. because that is the antithesis of everything that we opened our businesses for. Yeah. So how do you think being so invested in your business mm. is going to give you the fame that you need to scale? Mm. That was a very long-winded question. Yeah, and there was a few questions in there. So the question is, <laughs> <laughs> repeat it again. How do I think that being so invested in our business will give us the fame? That we need that to we grow. Need. Right. Well, I want to reframe the word fame because I actually don't think that um, it's, it's, it's about, I, I'd rather talk about it as following um, more than anything um, because I do, so, so to me the answer is influence. So when you're invested, so just you know, you've just worked through that out loud. So let me work through it out loud too. When you're invested in your business, I mean, I fundamentally believe believe that you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Once people take care of their basic needs, they get to self actualization. They get humans want to give. They want to love. They're driven by purpose. By give back. You know, as soon as people have got enough money, most of the time they start to work out who to give it to, how yeah. to contribute. If we're driven from that that sort of, well, so let's acknowledge that we are driven in our core once we've taken care of our basic needs by by purpose and contribution. When you're in that space, um, you are creating a a, a sort of energy field around you that is is quite magnetic um you you are you're creating you know those times where um so as you sort of journey up maslow's hierarchy of needs up that pyramid you 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 be getting self aware you're growing personally you've got things to contribute to society as far as advice give back throughout the journey you know and you become a leader in your space Sort of automatically, just by because you because you have to. Business makes you do that. As I was just about to say, whether you think you are or not, whether you're working and it's just you, yeah. the fact is you have to have some kind of leadership skill to survive. That's right. And you're already inspiring people around you cognitively or consciously or not or subconsciously. You're already creating um an energetic sort of 
uh, vibe around your business. And that might, you might sort of package that up and I'm air quoting now as your, as your service, your customer service. You've got your product and your customer service. But really to, you know, the customer service, the values that drive that customer service, why you put up with this and not that, or why you would give that but not this, comes from something and it comes from your belief system. And that belief system gets more and more certain the more and more you show up, the more you have to be courageous and keep showing up. Like as you, like I said, as you, as you go, as you develop this business, you're growing and you get positive feedback for that growth. Like you, you take a courageous step. Someone goes, wow, that was inspiration. So that's feedback. Yes. That's that people like that. Do more of that. Um, and then before you know it, you're sort of at that top, at that self-actualization. You've got enough money you want to contribute and something's been built in the process. And it's not just a product. It's a brand that is um, that has a set of belief systems, it, that has a set of values and principles that people can buy into. And it started with you. So when you say fame, I say followers. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, Weirdly, marketing is actually a bit like a religious, you know, re- religion, religion cult. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you do. Someone started with a belief system, and in your case, you're working with people that are pairing a product to that as an objective representation of their belief system. Um, and other people are, are um, uh, you know, uh, other people are doing it like me in a service based setting. Um, but one way or the other, people are buying into your perception, your reality, your 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 principles, your values, your belief system, and they want to be a part of that because being a part of it makes them feel something. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And yeah, belonging. You know. I feel like that is where the longevity comes in. Like I love to use brands like Lululemon mm. because they are. I mean, they give back. They they sell activewear. Yep. Right, like what the product really cool. that they sell mm. is, you can buy that same thing. I don't buy their product, yep. but I appreciate their brand. So I'll buy from somebody else because their product is better for me, but I don't really identify with their brand. I would never call the other brand out as these guys are amazing, but. Lululemon have done an amazing job at creating a brand because they do have all those values, the community, you can go in for the free classes. Mm. Even when the product is crap, like they had that thing a few years ago where the tights were see-through when you bent over, like Mm. that would have broken so many other companies. But because they built that following, that community, whatever word we're going to, to use, because they've built those people who are invested in the brand, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, whatever, you know, what's next? We'll, we'll forgive them, right? Like, we'll forgive we'll, them. We'll, we will treat because people start to treat the brand like a human. They're forgivable. They made a mistake. That's not what they really meant because we've got enough evidence of everything else that they're doing that their intent was good. Yes. But when you don't yes. know what someone's belief systems are, we judge immediately and, and we don't know. Like, is their intent good or, or bad? And most of the time to protect ourselves as humans, we decide that it's bad, so we we run away, you know. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. It is 100% the pathway to longevity is, is, is creating. I mean, you think of the longest relationships you've got in your life, friendships, um, you know, if you're close to your parents, your sister, your brother, whatever. It's because their intent to you is good They've got a set of beliefs that they stand that they that they stand by and stand for, um, and they constantly show up as that. So they're reliable. People purchases people like things that are reliable, especially when the world's gone mad in the background. Yeah, and this is where you were talking about earlier about the like the influence mm. is when people. This is the reason those manufactured brands don't stay around because they weren't in it for anything other than. It's a cash generating machine. It trades on the celebrities use it to build their street cred yep. and to build their followers. Yep. And the companies use it as a cash cow. That is all it's designed for. It's not designed yep. to fix people's problems. Yeah. It is literally designed to, you have a following of Gen Zers. We can sell this to them. Yeah. Well, a, it's just, let's flog it. And, and this is the exact direction. And I was just um, talking into my voice recorder today as an idea for a blog. Um, this is exactly 
the same problem we've got right now with TikTok. So, so when you're when you're um, I, I call TikTok a generation of impactless influencers because what you would think about what they're actually contributing to society right now, it's the shortening of attention spans. Like it's you barely got their attention before they're gone again. You know, what yeah. can you possibly contribute that's positive to the world in that period of time? Not a whole lot. Um, and you're actively making our children be able to not concentrate on anything of meaning and purpose. For, for a longer period of time. For a longer period of time, which means we are now. So when it's it's like the fairy floss or the milkshake or the snack food, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a mental obesity that is is taking place. And it's a, and I'm sorry to get <laughs> I'm really extra. You're getting your ranty pants on. Oh, I'm getting my ranty pants on because I mean, I'm not saying that there's not probably one, two, three hundred people on there that have got something more to offer and they're using it as a platform. But here we are in a generation of people with no attention span, feeding their lack of attention span, contributing not a whole lot um, as a conscious curation uh, to the to the world. I mean, they might claim that they're making people happier, but again, it's the escapism. And and look around, what are you escaping from? Like, shouldn't that be where your attention's at? You know, mm. and this is this is why I love that your your stance on 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 retail is build a brand that matters, build a brand that contributes back to society once you've taken care of your needs. You know, yeah, I love that. I love that. So, if you've if you've built this brand subconsciously, because a lot of people don't realize that the values, the ideals, the community that they've built has actually been as a result of them. So first up, kudos to you guys who are listening because you have built a brand. It might not be as big as you want yet. Maybe it's bigger than you thought right now. But the fact is you have people who love what you do and they love what you sell and they will follow them. How do we scale that? Because I know that 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 was definitely an issue for me in my stores because people would come in to see me. And then as I got more staff and as I didn't work in the store, I would hear, because I'd be in the office out the back, oh, is Sal here? No. Oh, well, what day is she in? And I'll come back. Yeah. And that's an issue because that's taking away from people who may well be better at what they do than I ever was. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've had to learn is there's a pretty good chance that someone is better at whatever it is you do than you Mm. in your business. Mm. So how do we, how do we scale? what we've already built without coming undone. Yeah. So it comes back to that idea of, of, of sort of creating, like once you've infused your values, principles, beliefs, I'm just going to call it your unique contribution into your brand. There's the tangible representation that's your product and then there's a sort of experience that people have being a part of it, that conscious curation. Well, first of all, you've got to get conscious of it. What did you actually do? So it's about breaking down. And, and, and people think that creativity can't be replicated. And, and in a sense, it can't be. Like there's, it's a flexible framework, but there's definitely still a framework to it. Like when I write my impact alchemies, it's entirely different every time for each person with what they need out of it. Um, but And it's a very creative process, but it's a process still, you know. So, so it's about creating um, sort of examining the component parts of what it is. So it might start with you thinking about your principles, your beliefs, um, how you got here, the experiences. Um, And it might be sort of packaging that up into an understanding of what your unique contribution is. But then to scale, you're going to need to go to the sort of other key leaders in your company and understand what they contributed as well <clears throat> to that and be able to package that up into their unique contribution. And then, you know, you do that with two, three, four, however many people are that are there that were part of it at the beginning or part of it as it grew um, where it became what it became and get conscious about their contribution to it and then look at how that comes together into a whole picture. And weirdly enough, there'll be a way to break down sort of I like to look at it from two different angles one is the customer's perspective what is the customer experiencing as they go through the journey of of, of interaction with your brand and that might be over one transaction or over a series of years you know if they're in in your CRM and they're getting emails and things like that it's like a whole experience 
So there's a sort of customer pathway, but there's actually a way of looking at what you did sort of internally to create that customer experience. And I've done this before. I worked with a um, a, a woman that worked in recruitment, actually, and she'd built up this amazing business, like a million dollar a year turnover by herself, not even with a VA. Oh, wow. Know? And uh, yeah, insane, like so, 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 so busy. And this happens a lot in service-based businesses. People come to me and say, how do I, I, I basically need to duplicate myself. Yeah. And I'm like, well, believe it or not, it's actually possible. And I look at it as two different things. Like I say, that sort of energetic experience that people are having, um, how do you create that? Like when you're conscious of why you show up like that, your principles, your values, you know why the energetic experience feels like that to them. Um, and then you also look at the systems and the processes that you can put in place that can actually sort of replicate that. So once you know what those values principles are and you know how you want to make people feel, there's ways of making them feel like that without your involvement. You know, it could be through an email. It could be through the words of an email. Actually, just the other day I bought something, um, some some gut health stuff from a company called Happy Mammoth, which might be popping up in your news feed too. I don't know. It depends whether you've got gut problems, I suppose. <laughs> But what I'm just already so drawn into is that the 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 owner of the company, he's obviously doing very well for himself and it's 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 obviously an automated email sequence, but he's taken me on the journey and they're massively long, sorry about that, massively long emails, like story emails of his journey from the beginning. Now, he's obviously so much further down the path now, like 10, 15 years probably, but I'm at the beginning. So I'm back with him at the beginning and I'm reading these stories like some sort of travelogue, you know, and, and I'm reading them. Like I'd, his subject lines are so enticing and I'm opening them up and especially as a marketer, I'm curious too. And I'm like, you know, so but that's what I mean. Like he's brought me on the journey now and I yeah. get to see myself in his future, you know, in, in the future of this brand and I'm, I'm buying into it. You know, I can feel myself. You, you want to be part of that community. I want to be. I didn't necessarily want to sing from the rafters, hey, guys, I get bloating and gas. <laughs> <laughs> but you but, will quite happily get on a podcast and talk about the brand. Totally, 100% will. Exactly, right there. And that, and that is key because that is the drum beaters. We call them drum beaters. You are the person who yeah. we love because yeah. even if you fix your gut health problems, hmm. say it happens next week, you will still get on and talk about the brand. And the drum beaters are the people who will go to the ends of the earth to tell everybody else how fantastic you are and your brand is. And I wonder whether he's consciously curated this. You know, I actually don't think he has. I think it's a bit of an accident, actually. He's just a pretty good storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, and but but I would I wonder if I went into their offices and said, okay, you know, he's leaving. Um, and and now we're rebirthing this company into its uh, into a you know a series of cosmetics, let's say. So it's another range, and his story isn't really relevant to that anymore. But he's got a community, and why not sell some other natural thing to them? You know. Mm -hmm. So what? How would we replicate that success? For That's that? a really good question because I'm actually in my head as you're saying that I'm thinking of three brands, and I say brands that I know of that have built exactly what you're talking about mm. and gone on to sell. Mm. So the first one is Flora and Forda. Julie Mather's absolutely amazing. She has done fabulous things for the eco industry. The other one is, um, like her name escapes me right now, but she had the biggest online wellness store, Nourish Life. Can't think of her name. And she was bought out by BWX Brands. And then just recently... A business called The Healthy Mummy, which was a subscription business that I was subscribed to for meal plans, but they also sold shakes and things. I mean, I, I didn't have any of that stuff, but the key, you know, the key thing is they sell the shakes and whatnot to yeah. other people. They were all recently acquired by big brands. Yeah. And so the question then, like you said, the question in my head is, how are they going to replicate that same community, that same brand, the same everything? Like, well, is I it even possible? I yeah. wonder whether they can. And I've got a story about that, actually, because um, when I started my, I, I met I met the owner of Frank, you know, Frank Body. Frank Body, yep. yeah. 
So when they were just frank, actually, before mm-hmm. they had to add the body on because <laughs> they were that little, they didn't realise that they were but, but, on somebody they, else's trademark. Yeah. For those who are listening, they do coffee uh, body scrubs. And they were the first ones in Australia yeah. to do it. They were the original and the best. But the, the, the amazing owners of, those, of that business, it was an accident. That business was a total accident. And this is what people love, those, those sort of underdogs. The unicorn stories. stories. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and they were also copywriters. The, the, the three women that are involved in the brand were also copywriters and had a different business called Willow something and copywriting. Anyway, um, they got bought out. I can't remember by who or for how much, but what as part of the deal, the at least four of the five people stayed on to direct the brand um, as part. It was it was like contracted in because the company that bought them knew that they were kind of nothing without these amazing story writers and 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 the fact that they were there as the founders. Now, I believe that there is a way that you can, like at some point, a brand takes on its own energy. Yes. And you need to release at that point. You need to allow other people to come in. You you need to let go, but but leave enough of yourself in there. And I really believe it's about making that that process, taking it from that kind of internal glow into an external objective sort of concept that everyone in the company can buy into, including the new investors. And I think there's some sort of genius in that. And I know it's possible because I've done it with other people, not, or not on a massive scale like that, but, I, but, it, but I've done it in small like web development companies where there's 10 employees and we smoothed out their entire process from lead generation right through to delivery by taking it outside of the, the the CEO and the guy that's out there doing sales. We kind of systematized what he did energetically when he was out there and what they were doing in the delivery department and what they were doing over here and made it into a concept that everybody could buy into. And now we've got this customer experience that is sort of agnostic of the people that are in, in the company at any given time. But still has the same ideals, still has the same following, still has the same people, still has the same ethos. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that, I guess that's what makes you investable, you know. In that. Well, that, that's exactly what I was thinking is the companies that have bought these brands have, one, bought because of the customer database. Mm-hmm. They, they, they have other products that can service those same customers, mm-hmm. but also they wouldn't buy it if there was no brand. Yeah, exactly. Because the brand is what they want to be attached to. Yeah. And, you know, there must be millions of stories of brands just going <laughs> like kaput after someone's invested, you know, and they're going. There are. Yeah. 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 Any quick tips on how we can do that? Like we've you've talked about processizing this and taking that inner glow and turning it into an external like set of objectives. So any quick tips on how we can actually do that? Over the last few years, we've been on a on a sort of, you know, like like we kind of went back to ground zero together as as sort of humanity. And 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 what's happened is that this idea of the sort of the guru. And every that person that's the master that knows everything, like they got brought down a few pegs <laughs> and we're all on that journey upwards together. So my quick tip would be go back to the beginning. What was there at the beginning? What were your values, your principles? What was the drive? And that sounds simple, but I mean, take the masks off because since then you've had to put on the mask of like CFO and COO and CEO and, you know, mum that's you're probably torn between 15 different, you know, um, priorities. And, you know, the, I, I mean, I'm being generalistic here. Maybe you're not a mum, maybe you're not a wife, maybe you're a single woman going for But you've got other priorities in life too. Oh, yeah, things pulling on you. Yeah. And you put on masks to get through you get into that warrior warrior s sort of productivity energy to get shit done you know and you need to sort of take some time and go back and think if i was going to rebuild this from nothing and take people on a journey again what did i believe to begin with what was driving me to begin with who would i have if i could have chosen anyone to be around me at the beginning who would they be what would their values be what would their principles be and combine it. You've, I mean, the truth is personal development. Get get aware. Mm. Get get back to the authentic whole self. Back to what makes you unique, and own it, and and craft it into something that other people can understand. You know, I see a lot of times that growth 
that we take as business owners and as people as we get older. One of the things I see that happening in is in product descriptions where they're full of jargon. Oh, yeah. And the poor person coming in is like, I don't know what that means. And now I feel very alienated and very alone and maybe I don't want to buy from you. So that concept of just going back to why did you start this? And it may have changed as you grew. Maybe you realized that that wasn't the perfect Mm. product or the perfect consumer or that's not actually, those people have no money. So to me, it's like, well, what was the reason you started the business? And then who are the people, like you said, that you want to hang out with, whether it's your customers, whether it's peers, whether it's, you know, people, mentors, who are the people who, if you had a choice, I remember in a brand strategy that I did once, the company said to me, if you had to pick a celebrity to personify your brand, who would it be? And I remember thinking, oh, it has to be, we sold eco baby products like Tony Collette because she's like a little bit hard ass. She's a bit of a crunchy mama. You know, she is prepared to get stuff done and get her hands dirty, but you kind of like her too. She's not overly flamboyant. She just wants to get on with life. And, And I remember the brand guy saying to me, I don't think anyone has ever picked Tony Collette before. <laughs> and I was like, well, I did go to school with her. Uh, yeah. That's my claim to fame. But she's always just struck me. I think um, Rachel Griffiths is also one of those people too, who it's not about being the most glamorous. It's about being like a person and being out there and being considerate and kind and what can I contribute? And they were the people who to me was like, well, they're the people who I associate. And there's probably other people too. But I thought that was a great question. And maybe that's something that if people are listening and they're thinking, well, it's actually you, because what then you can take away is actually that person that I must have a lot of those same qualities. That's right. I was just about to say, I mean, what I stand for is uniqueness. So I, 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 I don't, I mean, I know we're all humans. We've all got, you know, similar drive. We're similar in so many ways, but we are so different and so uniquely different um and and i actually think um that i would love for your listeners to discover their uniqueness and package that up why don't they turn themselves into a celebrity a celebrity yeah what would i if i was a celebrity what would i stand for like and the best way to do that is take away all the limitations if money time energy focus none of those things were a problem like just how would I show up and this this sort of the most expansive version of you will come to light and imagine that person as a celebrity um because I I think it's disempowering putting yourself into into somebody else's shoes I really feel like creativity has been lost in the way that we approach life these days and I'd love to re-inspire it (laughs) awesome I think that is the perfect point for us to finish up this great conversation and say, if people would like to connect with you or have a chat with you, where can they find you? They can find me on Instagram at Kath with a K, Clark with an E on the end and two little underscores. Um, we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, good on you. And um, all, and or LinkedIn. I also hang out there quite a bit too. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much for this really interesting conversation. <laughs> we went from snakes to shops, to authenticity, and really, like, I think that, you know, I know the word is bandied about, but really empowering people to take a good hard look at themselves and see the good stuff. Yeah, totally, totally. You're more inspiring than you think you are most of the time. (laughs) Love it, love it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Selena. So that's a wrap. I'd love to hear what insight you've gotten from this episode and how you're going to put it into action. If you're a social kind of person, follow me at The Selena Knight and make sure to leave a comment and let me know. And if this episode made you think a little bit differently or gave you some inspiration or perhaps gave you the kick that you needed to take action, then please take a couple of minutes to leave me a review on your platform of choice. Because the more reviews the show gets, the more independent retail and e-commerce stores just like yours that we can help to scale. And when that happens, it's a win for you, a win for your community, and a win for your customers. I'll see you on the next episode.